These things were hidden by the polymaths. They were hidden by the philosophers. The moon is 2,160 miles as its diameter. Same number as the number of feet, 216 for the height of the Pyramid of the Sun in Mexico. We multiply the diameter of the moon by 400 exactly, and we get the diameter of the sun. Do you know what the exact point inside of the sarcophagus is on planet Earth? If we were to measure it and look at it, it's degree measurement, latitude and longitude. The latitude for the exact center point of the sarcophagus in the King's Chamber is 29 point nine seven nine two point four five eight degrees the speed of light is two hundred and ninety nine million seven hundred and ninety two thousand four hundred and fifty eight meters per second these things were hidden by the polymaths polymath is to be a philosopher and remember, mathematics didn't mean study of math as number, study of quantity of science, right? It meant learning. So poly means many. Math meant learning. Polymath is many learnings. That's all that is. So the doorway to become a philosopher was to be a many learner. And once you became a philosopher, then you got into esoteric and wisdom and mystery schools. So the Egyptian mystery schools is where all the polymaths philosophers went. Mm -hmm. They all went there. In fact, you must go there. It is part of the process of initiation. So Leonardo da Vinci went there. Plato went there. Pythagoras spent 30 years there. They all go to the Egyptian mystery schools to and, learn and, in the land of Cam. And Yeshua. And Yeshua went there. Jesus and John the Baptist both broke into the pyramid. They, they both went there. They both studied at the mystery schools. Do you know there was a mystery school that had lived, been in existence for almost 500 years, that was closed down by Nazis when they occupied Egypt in 1944. Why was there a mystery school with the name of Leonardo da Vinci's School of Egyptian Mysteries? Why did that even exist? The reason it existed is because da Vinci, during his lost years of his life in Italy, spent three years, just over three years, in Egypt working for the Sultan of Cairo. He wrote about it in his compendium of his works after he died, which was called the Codex Atlanticus. It's in reference 1336 and 1337. It tells the entire story of, and it's written not backwards, because all of his texts are usually in backward mirrored text. So you'd have to look at it through a mirror to be able to read it easily. Mm -hmm. Although there is a good exercise to write backwards because once you start writing backwards, it absolutely strengthens the other side of your brain that's your non-dominant side. Mm -hmm. So whether you're left-handed or right-handed, you use the opposite hand. So it's teaching you that ambidexterity, but at the same time, it's helping you see the mirror of consciousness because that's what you start to tap into once you find this heart-brain balanced awareness. This is another exercise to do, but he wrote this letter in forward text. So whenever Da Vinci, because he always wrote backwards, whenever he writes forwards, it's encrypted. This was a draft letter, and it was titled, To the Devadar of the Sultan of Cairo, Babylon. And he tells the entire story how he's engaged by this sultan to be an engineer on a confidential project, right? Well, it doesn't say whether it's architectural. It sort of implies it's architectural, but it doesn't say exactly what it was. Although, what he does do is he goes through in very high detail his experience at Mount Taurus, now, everybody believes that Mount Taurus must be a reference to the Taurus Mountains that are in Armenia. In fact, Mount Ararat would have been one of those such mountains. This is where the Noah's Ark was supposedly, you know, up at the top of, landed after the flood. And he describes the town that he was in, a place called Kalindra or Kalender. There's no such town ever in the history of either Turkey or Armenia with this name. He was not referring to that. What you have to understand is that the original name of the Giza Plateau was Ross Tau. And if you read it backwards, it's Tau Ro. Another way to pronounce Tau, which is an, basically a Tau is a letter T, you rotate it slightly and it becomes Kai Ro. The bull mountain that he's referencing 
is actually shown to us in hieroglyphics. The original name of the Great Pyramid, among its names, one of them is Mer, and all three pyramids are Mer, Ka, and Ba. But the name of the Mer Pyramid is actually to the Apis bull. The chevrons, right, and a bull. So you see two chevrons and a bull, and that is the original name of the Great Pyramid, which means Bull Mountain. So he was referring to the pyramid, the Great Pyramid. And in this, he even says, it seems that they touch the sky, and it's oriented in such a way that it has sunlight on its east and west side an equal amount during the day because it's perfectly situated due north. He's exactly described. It's covered in the most resplendent and gleaming white limestone, is how he describes it. And he goes into a room or a cavern within this mountain, Bull Mountain, and the name of that, uh, you know, the cavern that he's talking about is this great cavern, which is actually a reference to the king's chamber. And he, right before you walk at the king's chamber, you have to bow, you have to sort of bend over. It's exactly 39 inches high. It's just one meter high, right? So we're not supposed to have a meter back then, but they measured it exactly as a meter. You, you kind of go in with your back hunched over, and he says he put his hand on his forehead, like waddling back and forth because it's about the same height as a bar, right? And he had this overwhelming feeling, by his own description, of going into this room of mystery and fear at the same time. You know, what was he, what was going to be lurking within that place in the darkness? What was he going to experience? Great fear and hope at the same time. And I remember the first time I went to the Great Pyramid, that's exactly how I felt. A mix of fear and hope. I'm like, what in the heck am I going to be dealing with here, you know? This is only some like giant, giant dog man going to come out and get me or something. You know, <laughs> I've spent now 11 nights inside the Great Pyramid. Wow. So you got all of this stuff sort of playing out and the story of Osiris playing out. And Osiris is personified by the constellation of Orion. The three stars on the belt match exactly the proportion positions of the Teotihuacan Plateau pyramids. They match exactly the proportions of the, the Ross Tau Plateau which is what we now refer to as the Giza Plateau, right? The Chinese pyramids as well. You see this relationship all over the world with these ancient pyramid sites. And by the way, they were all built on the same units of measure too. For example, the pyramids in Mexico, the base of the Pyramid of the Moon, is exactly the height of the Great Pyramid, which is 432 long cubits, 1.75 feet to each long cubit. Um, when you look at the height of the, of the Pyramid of the Sun, it's 216 feet, right? And you'll notice these are harmonic numbers, 432, 216. They always sum to nine. They're geometric numbers, right? That same height is matching as well the Menkare Pyramid. So these are clearly harmonic relationships. You look at the Pyramid of the Sun, it's 216 feet. Well, that's 25,920 inches. What's the significance of that? That's the long period of this, you know, orbit that we have with Sirius A in years. And by the way, if you just look up right now on Google, how far is the sun from the center of the galactic disk in Milky Way? It's 25,920 light years. <laughs> so how is it all so perfect? How is it all so perfect? I mean, when you think about Pyramid of the Sun, Pyramid of the Moon, do you know what the chances are of us getting a perfect solar eclipse? would be, we're the only planet in the solar system that has a solar eclipse. Do you know that? Do you know how that can actually happen? How does that even occur? Well, what has to, ha has, has to be the case is the diameter of the two objects have to be in proportion, the difference between the distance between the objects and the vantage point that you're looking at them from. So for example, the moon is 2,160 miles as its diameter. Same number as the number of feet, 216 for the height of the Pyramid of the Sun in Mexico. Exactly the same. Okay, so 216, 2160. We double that, we get 432, right? The diameter of the Sun is 864,000 miles, making its radius 432,000 miles. So wait a minute, that's a note A in Pythagorean tuning as well, by the way. So that means that with 2,160 2, miles as the diameter of the moon, we multiply that by 400 exactly, and we get the diameter of the sun. That's kind of a mind blower. Okay, so 
But then is the distance in proportion 400 times also? And yes, it is. The distance on average is about 232,000 miles between Earth and the moon. You multiply that by 400, it turns out to be 93 million miles, which is the distance we are from the sun. The average of the aphelion and perihelion. The largest distance from the sun, shortest distance from the sun. That's kind of mind-blowing. For me, it makes sense. But then there's got to be people, of course, listening to right now are like skeptical, saying like, you're just making up random numbers. And, and as someone who's into mathematics, what do you think the probability is that all of these mathematics are random? Is that even a possible hypothesis? No. No, <laughs> it's like, that's why I kind of laugh at that, because it's like, no, it's, it's just not possible. <laughs> so, and, and if you don't believe it, just look them up, okay? Look up the diameter of all of these things. You'll find also that because the, the sun has its diameter of, you know, 432,000 miles is why the sun has a circumference that's the Euler number. It's 2.718 million miles. Uh, it's hidden in plain sight. I mean, literally in plain sight. We look at it every day. But the metaphor is more important to me. The metaphor that the moon is, from our vantage point standing on Earth, the exact same size as the sun on average as we look at it. You never saw that? Have you noticed that before? You look at the size of the moon, it's in the sky, it's got the silver color, you got the gold color, but they're basically the same size. Yeah. Don't you find that a little strange? <laughs> I don't know. So I think there's a, a metaphor there about how we perceive the feminine, the moon, and the masculine, right? Masculine being relational to the sun. So what da Vinci did is he put on his squared circle, and by the way, it wasn't even a squared circle because he didn't match the area of the square and the circle in his very famous illustration. It's probably arguably the most famous illustration that we look at today. In fact, the if- Vitruvian man. Yeah, the Vitruvian man. If the radius is one unit of the circle, then the, the area for that circle should be pi because it's pi r squared, right? This is you know, radius squared times pi still equals pi because one, right? One is the radius value. Well, guess what the value is for the square? This is 200 years before this number was even discovered by Isaac Newton. It's the Euler number. The exact area. So artists throughout history, again, the problem of not having polymaths around, the artists throughout history are looking at it going, huh, that's pretty, looks good. Not even really thinking that the area doesn't match. It's not even close. Da Vinci was a lot smarter than that. <laughs> if he was trying to match the area, the mathematicians are looking at it, this is a joke. It's not even close. It's far away. 2.7 is very far from 3.14. Come on. They didn't understand, though, he was striking a balance between a triangle. So a triangle, an equilateral triangle, from its center point to its top part of it, you know, of its tip up here, the apex, would be two-thirds the length. One-third the length is from the center point to the flat base of the triangle. Right? If we take that exact same proportion and we use a weighted average value, so we take pi times two thirds, the long portion, right? And we add it to Euler 2.718 times one third, guess what the result comes out to? Three. 3.000. Here we have two transcendentally rational numbers through a simple weighted average around a triangle coming back to the divinity of the number three. The trinity. The trinity. Hmm. So to me, the chances that something like this could happen, right? It's like, here's another one. Do you know what the exact point inside of the sarcophagus is on planet Earth? If we were to measure it and look at it, it's at its degree measurement, right? So we're gonna look at latitude and longitude. The latitude, for the exact center point of the sarcophagus in the king's chamber is 29.9792.458 uh, degrees. That's exactly what it is. So 29979245.8 degrees. And that is the latitudinal reference to the geolocation of the Great Pyramid. Not just the Great Pyramid, but within its 13 acres down to one meter inside of the sarcophagus. Do you know that's the exact speed of light? The speed of light is 
792,458 meters per second. Did you know that the Great Pyramid, the name of the Great Pyramid, one of it is Mer, which means light? It literally means pyramid, pyra, is a Greek word for fire, which was also used to reference light. Mid is like a mean or center point, the midpoint. (laughs) The mean of light is the name of pyramid, and it's exactly on the geolocation, at which point in time we had no reference to latitude or longitude, if you believe the dynastic building of the pyramid, which would have been 4,500 years ago, approximately. But wait, okay, so let's just say that might be coincidence. Let's take the other longitudinal reference. So the longitudinal reference for the same spot is 31.1342 degrees. So that doesn't sound like anything special. It's not speed of light, right? It's not close to speed of light. But what is it? Well, if you take 31, of course, it's going to be re- uh, it's going to be related to a circle or a sphere, right? Because degrees are always related to a circularity. So let's take 31.1342 and divide it by 360 degrees. What do we get? We get 0.0864. 0.0864. Now, if you've got on one axis light, and you were going to say the other axis should probably be something related to dark, Right? Sure. Light, dark, and doesn't time relate to dark? Isn't there something called like gravitational sort of time dilation? Did you ever see that movie Interstellar? Of course. Where they landed on that planet, they're only there for like 45 minutes, and the big wave came, and then it was like 23 years went by, they went back to the ship, the guy's mm-hmm. all old waiting for them. Yeah. Remember that? So you've got this time dilation effect, right? So gravity and time must relate to each other then. And every physicist would tell you that that's the case because you will have time effects. You know, the time on Jupiter is different than the time here because the gravitational effect there is greater than it is here. So what is this reference of 864? Well, is it a coincidence that we have 86,400 seconds in every day and that the sun's diameter is 864,000 miles? Now, if I could make a perfect time system and I was going to construct it. I'd be like, okay, how do I geometer this shit out, right? I'm going to like make this thing. I'm going to have it relate to the thing that I'm going around. And it's going to be related to its diameter. And then that's going to then resolve into every day of 24 hours, which comes out to be the exact relationship of the diameter of the sun. Please. <laughs> so now the latitude and the longitude are light and time references. Really? 